Good morning, and welcome to worship at First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ here in downtown Columbus. This is our service of morning prayer and communion. We are glad that you have joined us this 11th Sunday after Pentecost. We hope that you're with family or friends or can invite them to join as well. Today, as you worship, be sure to go to the website and get the service, follow along. It should be accessible to you, uh, www.first-church.org. Also there, you will find uh, forgiving purposes for the mission and ministry of the church, uh, Prompt Forgive, and there's a way that uh, you can use that to give as well. Following worship, we will have a Zoom chat, uh, coffee hour together, so feel free to join us there. You'll also find that in your bulletin and uh, a link to that that should work. We're hoping it works. And don't forget to get together the elements for communion because we'll have communion a little bit later this morning. It is good to be together no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey. You are welcome here. Let us worship God. This is the day which God has made. Let, Let us rejoice. rejoice and be glad in it. O God, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Praise to the holy and undivided Trinity, one God. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. <laughs> Across the globe, we had different faces, 
And so what I love about this is that as, as you come in to look at the, some of these faces of Jesus, that you'll see that he is shown in the way that um, the artist in that area sees him, which isn't, it, it's just so beautiful. Uh, there's some images that are very feminine. There's some images that um, are of, of Jesus on the cross. Uh, there's one with Mary holding him. But all of these images reflect the times and the places of Christians across the ages. And why is that important? It's important that we feel and experience and know Jesus as one who is connected to us intimately, and one that we can relate to, uh, someone that um, we see him and experience him in a way that brings us close to him. And so I show this to you today. So that um, and wherever in my office, I'll show it to you again up close. We are back, we are back together again. But I want you to see the faces of Jesus. In confirmation last year, um, one of the when I showed this to the kids, one of the kids said, "I thought Jesus was white." And I said, "Actually, he was from the Middle East, so he probably was very much like the, the features and the colors of Middle Eastern people. He would have been." much darker uh, than we know him in the European pictures that we have, right? And it was really interesting because that question came from an African-American member of the congregation in our church. And um, there was a smile that came across her face and she said, I've always wondered, and that's wonderful to know. So, embrace the many faces of Jesus and let us um, experience him both in our hearts, but also in our mind's eye for all the gifts and blessings he brings us in so many places and in the whole world. We'll see you soon. reading from the book of Genesis, chapter 45. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, and Lord of all his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. 
You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, while Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our second reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew in the 15th chapter, beginning in the 21st verse. Listen for the word of God. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side. While he dismissed them, Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from the region came out and started shouting, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting at us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and she knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered her, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God.
Today we continue in the sermon series for such a time as this, Seven Lessons for Living Through Pandemic Times. We've looked at lessons uh, that have included uh, getting into good trouble, that have included making your life matter, and have also taken a look at how we learn in a pandemic from the past and then not repeat it. Today I want to look at something that doesn't necessarily look like it's a pandemic lesson, but you'll see how it works. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. This Canaanite woman that we just met in the Gospel of Matthew had an enduring and endearing quality. That was she was very persistent. She was determined to get not only the attention of Jesus, but also um, to trust in him, even though she was outside the nation of Israel, to trust in him to be the healer that she needed in her life. So while she is pushing Jesus uh, to, to come and take care of that which is uh, awful, the demon-possessed life that she's talking about. She, she, it's her daughter, of all, of all people. She does not want her daughter tormented anymore by what is assailing her, right? And so the disciples say, tell her to go. Get rid of her. Get her out of here. We don't want her to bother you. And Jesus says, I'm not here for you. I'm here for my own people. I'm going to take care of them. I've got to do this this way. But she's persistent. And finally, it is her persistence that breaks through with Jesus. If I learn anything in this week, this 100th anniversary week of the passage of the 19th Amendment, the amendment which gives women the right to vote, August 18, 1920, I learned that it was the persistence and the drive and the consistent determination of women for 70 years through generations of women. The persistence continued. And actually, it was not just persistence. It was, it was a torch that was handed from some of the earliest believers at Seneca Falls in the 1830s all the way to 1920. This, it was this absolute commitment that women are equal, that the vote should be for all men, all women, all people in America. And so they came at it different ways. Alice Paul was known for her very uh, strident and, and determined way, which would get her, in the, get her in jail quite often. But there were others who worked like Carrie Chapman Catt in the end, who worked through the processes of government to make change. And so here's what happened. Uh, in the end, the third or fourth, depending on how you count, generation of leaders comes into the 19 teens and into the First World War, and they're trying to get this done. And Woodrow Wilson is against the woman, the women's chance to vote. Uh, we found other things out about Woodrow Wilson through the years as well. <clears throat> but one of the things was he did not want women to vote. And if you think about it, to get the vote, women had to have men agree to this. They had no power, if you will, to get the vote themselves. They didn't have the vote, right? So they needed to get the goodwill of men on their side. So in the end, their efforts to support the war, their commitment to go overseas in World War I, to be on the front lines, literally caring for the soldiers, made a difference. And finally convinced Woodrow Wilson to get on alongside. So in the time that we're talking about, the amendment was passed, but for an amendment to go through in the United States, you have to have all of the states ratify it, or 30, you have to have two-thirds of the states ratify it. At that time, 36 states. 35 states had ratified it, five had rejected it, four were not going to take a vote, they didn't want to give women the vote. 
Wow. But there was one state, came down to a state called Tennessee, came down to Tennessee, and there was one man, came down to one man. It was a tie vote. And a guy who had been against uh, the suffragists um, all his time in the legislature, a 25-year-old man named Harry T. Burns, got a letter from his mother. She writes, Dear son, hurrah, and vote for suffrage, and don't keep them in doubt. I noted Chandler's speech. It was very bitter. I've been watching to see how you stood, but I have not seen you stand up for anything yet. Don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Thomas Cat, Carrie Chapman Cat with all the rats who are against her. Is she the one that put rat in ratification? Ha ha ha, no more for mama this time. With lots of love, do the right thing, mama. Go! Oh! <laughs> so, so Thomas got this letter from his mom in rural Tennessee. From her farm, this letter came. He carried the letter in his pocket he walked into the hall against the vote and stood up and stood up and voted for the suffragists. And with that, it passed. He was a conservative Republican against this and changed because of his mother. And because of that, we had the 19th Amendment. I, I need to say this, um, the genius of all of this is uh, that like the Canaanite woman, uh, the women uh, suffragists never gave up. They never gave up. They were unrelenting. They would not stop up to the very final vote. A man who no one expected to do anything but fall into line stood up and did the right thing. And after the vote came in a very significant piece called A Memo to the Women of America, Carrie Chapman Catt wrote these brief words, and I'll share them with you, and with this I'll come to an end. She wrote, The vote is the emblem of your equality. Women of America, the guarantee of your liberty. That vote of yours has cost millions of dollars and the lives of thousands of women. Women have suffered agony of soul, which you never can comprehend that you and your daughters might inherit political freedom. That vote has been costly. Prize it. The vote is power, a weapon of offense and defense. It is a prayer. Use it intelligently, conscientiously, prayerfully. Progress is calling to you to make no pause. Act. Keep moving. So the spirit of those who preceded us are calling us not to lose track. I sent this to my daughters and I said, there's no excuse for you not to vote, never again. There are so many people in this land who up to this time have been denied the opportunities to vote for all sorts of terrible reasons. And even African-American women and Native American women didn't get the vote till the Civil Rights Act passed in 1965. It was really for white women for the first 45 years because of all the roadblocks placed in the path of minorities and immigrants and women of color. So there's no excuse. As we consider these pandemic times, we have opportunities to respond and one of them is the vote. So use it, use the vote. No matter who you are, use it intelligently, conscientiously and prayerfully and be as persistent in your advocacy for your own family and what is right as the Canaanite woman who was a woman, as Jesus said, of great faith. Amen. God be with you. And also with you.
that there may be purpose and fulfillment, O God, in all that we do. That we may show others this day the love that you have taught us. That the church throughout the world may respond to your call for peace and justice. That those who are in need be helped and comforted. O oh God, we join our hearts in prayer, and we pray for our world and our nation and this community. We pray for those in our church family who are in need of healing in body, mind, or spirit. We pray for the citizens of this city. May your guiding hand be with all of them. We celebrate this day with those who have birthdays and anniversaries this week. Especially, we are grateful for Dr. Will Fernald and his birthday this week. We pray, O oh God, that you would watch over um, school districts and administrators, teachers and students as they enter into this new fall academic year in whatever form it it comes in. May you continue to enrich all of their lives, embrace them with your love, and guide them with your spirit. We lift to you now in silence or aloud the prayers that are on our hearts this day. Lord, hear our prayer. That we may be strengthened by your grace for the tasks of this day. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Almighty God, give us faith to live this day, not knowing where it will lead, but with the assurance of your love and guidance are with us always. Through Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, our offering goes to support uh, choices, uh, the, the, um, the do domestic violence shelter here in Columbus, Ohio. It's part of the larger Lutheran social services here in the city, and choices works to help women and children get out of abusive situations in their homes. And especially during the pandemic time, this has been even more heightened. So the work of choices to help people find hope, to help them find safety, to help them find a path for new life is so important. So please give generously to Choices.